Welcome back to Turning Hard Times and Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really pleased to have with me once again Dr. Quentin Henning. Uh, I must say up front that I have a very strong vested interest in having Dr. Henning on my show because his company, Novo Resources, is not only my number one pick in my newsletter, but it's also the largest allocation in my own personal portfolio. Dr. Henning uh, is the president and CEO of Novo Resources. Um, you know, we've, we've talked to him several times in the past, uh, so I'm really looking forward to an update from him. Novo Resources trades... Uh, in Toronto under the symbol NVO. You can buy it in the United States as I have under the symbol NSRPF. 88 million shares outstanding and trading recently at around $1.12 in U.S. money, giving it a market cap of around $100 million in U.S. funds. The company has uh, made a discovery, uh, a near-surface oxide discovery, free milling gold, uh, somewhere grading between 2.4 and 2.7 grams uh, of gold per ton, uh, just under a, a half a million ounces, but with enormous amounts of upside exploration potential. I'm expecting that Novo uh, in its current drill program will come up with more ounces probably. It's doing a lot of exploration and development work and so uh, we really want to uh, thank Dr. Henning for coming on with us again today. Thanks for joining me, Quentin. Thank you very much, Jay. Always good to talk to you, you know, just as a matter of background. I'd like you to explain for those of people that are listening to this show that may not have heard you several appearances in the past. You know, we have a lot of new people now paying attention to the gold mining sector and perhaps you could talk a little bit about what attracted you to Northwestern Australia? I must say that I got interested in your story so much because of a sort of a more of a romantic aspect to the idea, uh, your novel theories about how this the greatest deposit ever known to man, the Whitwaters ran gold deposit, so much gold in such a small area was concentrated. And your theories about how it was put there led you to Northwestern Australia. Talk to us a little bit about the Whitwaters ran deposit and your search for another and why you think you may have found one in Northwestern Australia. Sure thing. Yeah, look, uh, to give a little background, the, the Witwatersrand Basin in South Africa is the largest gold deposit on planet Earth. It's produced something around 1.6 billion ounces of gold over uh, historic times. Uh, that amounts to about 39% of all world gold production, which is just kind of astounding. The the Wits is a conglomerate hosted gold system. The gold is hosted as fine or occurs as fine particles within the conglomerates, often associated with carbon. And about 20 years ago, I did some work on that carbon. You know, a lot of people recognize it as being an important component in the gold ores, but really had no clear idea of what what it was in, in context. The work I did with myself and a few other people that has been published over the years indicates that this carbon was actually fossil remnants of cyanobacterial mats that lived way back at the time of these conglomerates were deposited, and the the gold was actually precipitated by these uh, organisms. The, the oxygen that these generated pulled gold out of seawater. Uh, back in that days, gold concentrations in seawater would have been much higher than they are today, and this was almost like a little gold factory. These these bugs were kicking off oxygen, really the first oxygen on Earth, and as a result, it was precipitating gold. Uh, we see that uh, pattern in Australia. Australia, the, the rocks we're dealing with are very similar in age to the Witwatersrand Basin, so it, it basically was deposited in that critical time period. And at Beaton's Creek, for example, we see uh, a fine-grained gold component that is likely a precipitated gold form uh, probably occurring in the similar or having, having formed in a similar way to those in South Africa. Uh, we do see paleo-alluvial gold for sure. Mm-hmm. Like we've got gold particles that are definitely washed into the basin. That's not a question. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's really that, uh, that secondary component, that precipitation event that kind of gives these deposits that extra bump. All right, so this took place then, as I understand it, Quentin, about the time that photosynthesis started to occur, and that's why you're talking as something, I think, with the Beaton's Creek project that you're working on now and, and moving towards production, that that is something like 2.7 billion years ago. Is that right? That's right. It was kind of a window around 2.65 to 2.95 billion years ago that this process really kicked into gear. Uh, and the conglomerates we have are right in the middle. They're about 2.74 billion years old. And so because there was so much more gold in the ocean water at that time, uh, with the occurrence of oxygen and these new this, this new plant life, I guess that uh, enabled the precipitation out of the ocean water into the plants. And uh, the plants collected the gold essentially, right? That's correct, yes. 
and uh, and so that's that was your theory. That was a new theory. That wasn't something that was widely thought of. And and when you did some work at, at Newmont and elsewhere, you did your you you studied this in great detail and came up with this theory. And that's what took you to northwestern Australia. I guess what you were looking for was a sort of a shallow sea basin uh, and the rocks that were of this age, right? That's correct, yes. When we found it at uh, near the town of Nulligine in northwest Australia. Okay. Uh, so you've more or less, uh, I think, proven the concept that you have a Whitwaters Rand like conglomerate deposit there. You put a, a deep hole down, uh, some was it two kilometers away from the surface area where you're working now, went down, what, 600 meters or so, uh, and, and you intersected the same reef, right? Do I have that right? Yes. We, w- there was a couple of years back, we drilled a hole, a vertical hole, tested the the, the down dip of these same reefs, we encountered, I think it was three or four reef units that graded around 0.x gram. Uh, they're definitely out there. In hindsight, the drill, drill hole was too far from the shore. I probably should, you know, should have pulled it back, but I didn't realize the, the nuances of geology at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it did demonstrate that this process was, uh, you know, continued out into the basin for sure. And it, it's still alive. We need to simply explore closer to the shoreline. All right, so you've uh, you've done some work. You've done quite a bit of work, actually, and you've done some metallurgical work now. You're uh, you're test mining now, I believe, and you're going to be processing uh, this material. And this will be part of a preliminary economic study that is scheduled to occur sometime in the near future, right? That's right. So what we're doing right now, we've drilled up a resource on the oxide portion of this. It's basically where these reefs come to surface. They've been subjected to intense weathering. Uh, the oxidation has broken the rock down. It's affected effectively broken down into its original components. And so it's soft, it's free digging, the gold particles are are freely liberated, and they're gravity recoverable. So what we're doing is developing that oxide portion of the system first, and the intention is to get cash flow from that, get get some production that will then lead us down into the sulfide ores and, and gradually further out into the basin. Uh, to give people a sense of what we're trying to do at the moment, we've got a trial mine going where we've mined 30,000 tons of these conglomerates. Uh, we're presently crushing them and now processing them. And over the next two months, we anticipate uh, processing the entire 30,000 ton bulk sample. Uh, the data from this test will give us uh, much needed you know, detail about some of the economic aspects and, and geological aspects of the project that we need to fill in our economic study. Coarse gold is a challenge to work with. You know, nuggety gold uh, tends to be very hard to measure in rocks. You know, think about it. You, you got nuggets in your, in your scattered throughout your rock. You know, the odds of grabbing one in a, a sample that goes in for a fire assay are pretty slim. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, oftentimes uh, when you, you try to measure it, like you grab rock samples and have them analyzed, uh, you miss those nuggets. What we're seeing as we trial mine is we're, we we anticipate, I should say, uh, that we'll see a bump in the overall grade. Uh, what that bump might be, we don't know yet. We have to get that kind of data, but it will be very, very important uh, to this project going forward. So your resource uh, ranges somewhere between 2.4 and 2.7 grams per ton. Is that just with the oxides or does that inclu- include some sulfides as well? Mm-hmm. That does include some sulfides. The grids are very similar in oxide as, as well as the sulfide. Like I said, we have nuggety gold, so we are looking to see what kind of potential up up bump we you know upgrade we have um, in that material. Right. Well, your initial main resource was was a lot less than that. Even it was uh, just with I guess with drilling. Then you went to wider wider drill drill cores, I guess, and uh, you did some bulk sampling as well, right? Um, the initial resource was actually modeled on three meter benches, so it was a diluted grade. It was heavily diluted. Mm-hmm. Uh, what we did the second time around was we modeled the reefs very very tightly, so we we measured the tops and bottoms, and effectively we came up with volumes of rock that were tightly constrained and carried grade. So we eliminated that dilution. Uh, the trial mining we've done has actually demonstrated we can be very selective about how we mine this. Uh, when we're mining and stripping waste, for example, we can clearly tell when we've hit the top of the targeted conglomerate. Uh, the excavator operator can feel the boulders with his, you know, the teeth, up, teeth on the bucket. And then, uh, you know, when it comes time to extract the reef, he's able to, to mine it and tell where the rock goes soft underneath. So, you know, basically, uh, probably put blindfold on the excavator operator and 
he could mine it, no problem. Oh, that's uh, that's very important, of course. Dilution is is always a consideration. Well, when do you expect to have your preliminary ex- economic uh, report done, Quentin? I know that you were delayed a little bit in the permitting process. It sort of held you back a bit. But um, yes. do, do you expect to have uh, some small production from this trial mining yet this year? Yes. So we're going to process the rock over the next few months. Hopefully we've completed that by late October or early November. Uh, the data that we gather from this will include some assays that have to be taken at the end of the program. So uh, we'll have data to present to the public uh, about the actual grade of the material and some other aspects, uh, say sometime in November or, or you know towards the end of the year, we'll put it. Uh, yeah, we did get off to a slow start. The permit took quite a long, lot longer than we thought. Uh, the downside, you know, it, we were delayed. The upside is the project was reviewed in excruciating detail so that when we go to get our commercial permits, the uh, regulatory authorities will already have you know become familiar with the project, and hopefully that process should go much easier. Right, and your preliminary economic assessment, we might have to wait then until early 2017, possibly? Uh, we're hoping by the end of the year, but it could be early. It could, could yeah. slip a little bit. Yeah. Well, you have, uh, I, I know you have a small, relatively small gold debenture. You borrowed some money that way, and I think it was December 15th when you, if you produced 2,000 ounces or so by then, that you would have the right to call that or to repay it, I believe. is that? Do I have that right? Yeah, the way it works is the, the participants who bought the debentures, the units in the debenture, uh, have the right, w- once we hit a threshold of 2,000 ounces produced, they have the right to decide whether they want to receive, you know, payback in gold or in shares. The upside, like if you look at the the difference in price right now, the upside is greater if they receive shares at the moment, and we hope it will be going down the road too. But look, uh, uh, my suspicion is that when the time comes, they will probably opt to take shares. But you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. All right. So, how much of this uh, oxide near surface uh, material do you think exists there? Do you, do you have a lot? Do you have more exploration to do to delineate the resource, the oxide resource? Uh, there's certainly more oxide resource we can bring into the model. Uh, right now, our, our main goal is just moving towards production. Uh, the way I see this is, you know, why why spend a lot of time and money and, and get further distracted trying to add, you know, a re- immediate resource when we already have a sizable resource sure. we can develop. So, you know, we're, we're focused like a laser right now on, on making the mine. Can you give our listeners some sense of, of why the economics appear to be very robust? And again, the PEA will help to, to document that. But could you give our listeners some sense of what the uh, what the aspects are of this project that, that make it appear to be quite economically robust? Sure, sure thing. I mean, this is what's really fun to talk about. So the, the oxide, like I said, the rock is heavily decomposed, so it's quite soft. We do not need to drill and blast, uh, which makes for very cheap mining. Uh, we literally can push this around with bulldozers and excavators. We anticipate very cheap mining costs. The trial mine that we just did, uh, the the cost of moving one ton of ore down to the wrong pad, this is inclusive of everything, you know, stripping, uh, road maintenance, whatnot. Uh, the cost was less than ten dollars a ton. I mean, that's oh. just kind of astounding. Uh, the the other big plus is the gold. It tends to be fairly coarse. Uh, there is some fine grained gold, like I said earlier, uh, but we anticipate recoveries of around eighty percent in a commercial mine uh, at at very low processing costs. You know, perhaps less than twenty dollars a ton. And so, if we can keep mining and processing less than thirty dollars a ton, and we can recover. You know, say on the order of two grams per ton, you know, the economics look very, very favorable. Uh, the one thing I will point out is during the trial mining, uh, the processing we're doing does not include a fine grind component. So right. the gold will get out from uh, the trial phase will be largely the coarser, you know, coarser gold grains. Uh, so our recoveries won't be that 80%. They'll probably be more like 50 or 60%. But, that, you know, that's fine. For the trial mine, that's that's good enough. We don't have the uh, – we, we don't need to beat this thing to death. But um, we are very encouraged by the potential economics of the project. Uh, startup costs could come in, say, in the neighborhood of uh, – 18 to 22 million U.S. Wow, that is uh, that is incredibly low cap cost for this day and age for sure. And uh, probably once you, uh, assuming you, you prove up a much larger resource, uh, at some point in time there would be a milling process that would capture most of that gold you're not getting, the coarse, uh, the uh, fine grain gold that you're not getting now, right? That you expect not to get right away. Yeah, sure. Look, in, the, in any gold that's not recovered in our commercial scale mine will be a future resource. Sure. Yeah, sure. It'll be available that you know, it, it's not it's not walking off. <laughs> 
All right. Well, look, that's the, the Beaton Creek story. But you have some other things that are going on there that are, I would argue, perhaps equally exciting. Talk to us a little bit about some other properties you picked up that are all sort of encompassed in an area you refer to as the Mosquito Creek Basin. And I understand that it's very important to note that this deposit was laid down, you figure, somewhere around the same time, a little earlier, perhaps, around 2.9 billion years ago. That's uh, right. Sure. So to give context, uh, the Mosquito Creek Basin is immediately adjacent to Beaton's Creek. Uh, it's it's a somewhat older basin. It's about 2.92 billion years old. Sedimentary rocks, once again, a little bit different uh, facies. They're deeper water marine, or you know, sedimentary rocks. Mm-hmm. But nonetheless, they appear to be very, very rich in, in gold. Like in background levels of gold, these rocks have uh, a very, very high, probably five times crustal abundance, hmm. high level of gold. Uh, now, what's happened to those rocks, and what I didn't appreciate early on, is that you know through metamorphism and um, you know just uh, faulting and whatnot, the gold in that sequence of rocks was remobilized and, and reconstituted in these very very high grade veins. Uh, you know, initially I, I kind of looked at the, the occurrences out in the Mosquito Creek Basin as curiosities more than anything. But about uh, a year ago, we we were able to buy the Blue Spec property for about 650000 cash and shares uh, from a, an Australian company that had been struggling. And we were very fortunate in doing so. The resource at Blue Spec uh, is about 220,000 ounces. It's, it's uh, inferred and indicated, I believe. Uh, it's a jork resource, by the way. Um, and it's about 16 grams per ton gold. It's wow. also got a very high component of antimony with it. Now, the uh, when we bought the property, we spent about six months putting data together. We also did a lot of prospecting uh, on the ground, and we I changed my view entirely. Look, uh, I'll be frank. Uh, when we started to model the data and look at you know possible extensions and whatnot, it became clear that this thing was wide open. Looks like it could grow dramatically. So. Uh, we've we've acquired some further ground in the area, also along the blue spec shear zone. It's the same structure. It's it's ground further to the east mainly. Uh, so we now control something like sixty kilometers of strike along this blue oh. spec shear. And we've we've sampled in many locations and come up with you know plus ten gram, you know even tens of grams per ton type grades in many many new locations. Uh, mm-hmm. So we're we're very excited. We've got a drill program starting in a couple of weeks, uh, t- targeting the blue spec area, but also these new targets, these new uh, prospects that we found along strike uh, I, I sincerely think that this could be one of the better exploration projects I've ever worked on or ever seen um, it, we're very fortunate we recognized early on that the gold the, the rocks out there were quite enriched in gold and because of that we, we were able to kind of strategically position ourselves in to this new area all right. Uh, well, that, that's I, I noticed uh, some reference in uh, in the materials on your website that uh, in fact it is an area where people go every winter and they you know prospectors go and they pick up uh, free milling or just nuggets essentially and uh, it, it is known that whole area is just known every year people go there and and um, uh, I guess it fairly seriously they they go there to pick up uh, to pick up gold that's lying around on surface. That's right. Every winter, which down in Australia of course starts in around May. Uh, uh, people go out and, and metal detect, and it's probably one of, if not the most popular area in Australia to metal detect. Uh, we have hundreds of people, literally, and you know, I, every day we hear about new discoveries. Uh, got an email two days ago; somebody found 270 grams of gold. Obviously, uh, you know, it's it's the work, uh, the systematic, scientific approach that you will take that will uh, allow the investment community to start making some serious decisions about about what this is all worth and what it all means. You know, we can always hear uh, anecdotal stories about people who pick up ounces of, of gold here and there, but what really matters is uh, once you start putting this thing together systematically, how much are you going to be spending uh, on both projects, uh, Quentin, going forward uh, through the end of this year, let's say more or less? Yeah, so at, at Blue Spec with our exploration program, uh, our budget's uh, targeted at $1.8 million, uh, but I am looking to, to bump that up a little. We completed a raise a few weeks ago, and we have the bandwidth to, to bump that up to maybe two and a half to three. Uh, given the targets we have, they're fully, it's fully justified. You know, I, I can see some low-hanging fruit, so we're probably going to ramp things up there. As far as Beaton's Creek, uh, the mining, you know, the, the trial mining and processing uh, is going to cost around $2 million. We've spent about half of that already. Processing is going to cost you know roughly eight hundred thousand more. 
between now and the end of the year. So we're we're in good shape. We've got lots of money, and we're able to, to do the work we need to do. All right, and let our listeners know, Newmont is still a large shareholder. How many institutions, what sort of institutional holding do you have besides Newmont? How much does Newmont own? And, you know, because I think one of the concerns that, uh, that some people have is it's still kind of difficult to buy shares. I, I see the, the move is quite dramatic. Uh, today, for example, is looking at anywhere from one cent up to 10 cents up. And, you know, all around, you know, it's quite erratic. The share. Do you expect there to be more liquidity sometime soon? And, and who owns your stock right now, Dr. Henning? Yeah, sure. So Newmont holds about 22%. Uh, Mark Creasy, who's a well-known prospector in Australia, holds about 12 A group called Richmond Capital holds about 10 B- Between all of those three parties, myself and others in, inside Novo, you know, we control around 51%, I believe. The, you know, the free float, yeah, it's, it's a bit tight, but if you look at our, our volumes, they've been increasing, you know, combined uh, Canadian-American volumes, mm-hmm. they've been increasing towards the 100,000 shares a day level, which is, is great, you know, compared to a year ago, it was maybe 20 20,000 shares a day. Yeah, it's hard to get hold, hold of shares, but, uh, you know, I would urge people to, to be patient and, you know, look for, for opportunities. Just in summarizing now, what so what should people really be watching? What, should, what are the drivers for your shares going forward here? Your, uh, I guess it's the conclusion of your test mining and the results of that is, is first, and then, and then drill results from... Uh, sure, there's th- three, three uh, components. So uh, we didn't discuss a project we have in Nevada. We just completed drilling there, announced it earlier today. Uh, the results are going to come out over the next few weeks, so we'll have news from there. Uh, we'll start blue spec drilling here sh- sh- shortly. That's the high-grade project I discussed in Australia. Uh, blue spec should generate news over the next you know, four or five months as we drill and, and receive assays. And then, you know, last and not least, uh, the, the results from Beaton's Creek, the trial mining, which is really going to demonstrate to the world how good a project this is. Uh, that news will come out towards the end of this year. Well, wow, that's it. Really, is exciting. I mean, uh, there have been a large, uh, you know, long periods of time when uh, the shares seem to be going nowhere, and even more recently, a lot of the shares started moving uh, only in the last couple of weeks. No, Novo has started moving. Uh, it, it seems to me, Doctor Henning, that we're at the beginning of a very exciting period of time. Assuming, as I do, that we are in a bull market uh, of of some duration here, that should really uh, serve those that are on the long side of the of the gold share markets very well. But especially, I mean, I think your story stands out in my mind at least, from most of the others. So I want to thank you very much for the time. You've given us once again, Dr. Henning, and all the best to you, and uh, I hope we can do this again sometime soon. Thank you very much, Jay. 